Hello and welcome to the show. Like all times, we bring you a special guest today in the studio. What he has to offer is more than what we can take. Today's guest in the studio is Dr. Surya Rao. He's decorated with Padma Shri, one of the highest civilian awards by the government of India. He's known for his research work in the field of HIV and AIDS. All along his professional career, he has devoted half of it to HIV. More so because of the social stigma that is associated with it. Today, let us speak to him on his work in the field of HIV and also working across countries in the same field. Dr. Suri Rao, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Suri. If you look at your journey, many people would wonder that there's so much that you have done as a physician, then as a researcher in the fields of AIDS, and then to the recognition from the government of India and the work that you've done for people. How did it all begin? Did you ever imagine yourself as a person who would want to be in the field of medicine or field of service for that matter? What, what inspired you? How did you come about on this journey? So my parents uh, present and uh, in my village, when I was a student of this sixth class, there is not even a doctor who comes to us regularly. And uh, many people suffer, poor people, and nobody to take care of them. Some quacks use it to uh, treat them and uh, some superstitions. One day I noticed that uh, a doctor came from the city. I was told that uh, once in a while doctors come to this village also. Huge number of people waiting in the queue to see the doctor. And he could spare his only couple of hours and he went away. By 7th class when he came, our village got one PHC, primary, primary health care center. center. Yeah. A doctor was appointed there. But whenever he comes, he walks in the streets with a stethoscope on his neck. People from, say, president of the village to the class attender of the village, use it to stand up and sell you to the doctor. So that has given a big uh, inspiration for me. I can say it has been a light for me to see that I should also become, become a, a doctor. doctor. So than any other profession at that time, to take care of the deceased and to share our what we call service for the welfare of humanity, that what was the seated in my mind as early as when I was in seventh class only. Mm. From that day onwards, I, I was uh, dreaming to become a doctor and the first MSET examination came and fortunately, I was one of the very few got selected in the government college and my MBBS I did from uh, Andhra Medical College, Vishakhapatnam. It was established in 1920, one of the oldest medical, medical colleges, colleges of the country. in India. And then subsequently, I did my PhD from Andhra University. Then I did my MD from University of Colombo. Then I got my fellow of the Royal College of Physicians from London. Recently, the government of India has given me FAMS. That is, uh, in the sense, what I mean to say government of India, because the National Academy was established by none other than Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. The first convocation was given by Sarvapal Radhakrishna, the then president of India. And that National Academy works under Ministry of Health. So they have given FAMS, that is Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences to me. And also, as you rightly pointed out at the beginning, that Padmashri I got in the area of uh, Chikitsa Avam Shodh, Treatment and Research. My area of interest is mostly research. And all these years, but the main focus of men is only service. How best we can alleviate the suffering of people. How best we can bring out a new molecules to serve the particularly diseased and the people suffering from diseases. And as you rightly told in the beginning that why have chosen HIV and AIDS? It is very interesting to know, sir, because most of the times, Dr. Surya Rao, it happens that is a subject that causes so much of taboo in the yes, Indian mind. Yes. The moment somebody says AIDS and HIV, people are like, oh, yeah. we don't want to yeah. talk about it. Yeah. We just yeah. don't want to. Yeah. This mentality, I do not know whether it is exactly true or not, but it does not allow us to educate people about the disease. So there is a misconception and there is no uh, way of getting treated also. 
I appreciate uh, Srinidhi because uh, the way in which you, you have really studied about subject is true. Because what is happening today, we have to fight the stigma rather than the disease itself. The stigma is killing silently more people than HIV AIDS per se. Not only in India, everywhere. Even in the, I mean, uh, USA. Why I would say this? When Rockerson, the Hollywood star, when he was infected with HIV, asked to carry by a flight to other center for medical aid, the all co-travelers in the flight with a lot of fear, they got down of the flight. Then the entire headlines in the world, when Rockerson got HIV, in fact, one way it is uh, an awareness to the people, the other way that is carried a negative uh, feeling to the people that it's something this is uh, uh, which uh, people are totally having taboo, people are having totally stigmatization. It created a mass hysteria. Ma mass hysteria. Yeah. So even in India also, many hospitals, the staff nurses have gone mass leave when they heard yeah, the patient, uh, is, a patient is in the ward. Yeah. So that should not be there because it is not a disease which is transmitted by social contact. When you talk about this, yeah. uh, Dr. Rao, there are so many things that comes into picture. When you said people in a developed country yeah. Uh, yeah. face these kinds of things, of course, in India, with the kind of illiteracy, it becomes a little more challenging. Yes. But with the scales that you have risen to, yeah. uh, there might be a lot of challenges that you face too. I have been facing the challenges even till today. Because what happens, the moment we hear that there is a HIV positive patient, many hospitals in India are not admitting them. Many hospitals, they are not conducting deliveries for people who are positive. It is normally very sorrowful set even today. 31 years back, India got first AIDS case mm. in 86. And where is the failure? Failure on the part of NGOs, failure on the part of the government, failure on the part of philosophers, and failure on the part of religious leaders. Unless all come together and work see that we should fight on a disease, not the people suffering from disease. And I am facing a lot of challenges. When I addressed a, a medical body and combined with one service organization in Bhopal, then one gentleman, his student said, you are creating unnecessarily a sort of fierce psychosis among people. This is the land where Buddha born. This is the land where Rama born. This is the land where Gandhi born. Do you think that anybody in India have got uh, homosexuality? Do you think in India anybody has got? Do you think the promiscuity is there in India? Why you are necessarily talking about the disease? I faced a big blow, I can say. Then I said, my dear friends, if you what you said is correct, in India, today we are seeing 5.7 million positive people. This figure, six years back, today is 2.5 million positive. And we are number two in the world even today. And why we are number two in the world even today, when whatever you said is correct. So what is happening? What do you know you are not practicing? What are the values of this country? The ethical values of this country? the culture of this country, the samskara of this country, people like Lord Rama, whose philosophy was one wife, one arrow. And if that is really followed by people in India or, or elsewhere, where is the question of HIV in AIDS? Because 89% of people anywhere in the world are through heterosexual or homosexual or combined. Only 2 or 3% through mother to child about 7% through blood and one or less than 1% through needle and sterilization. So, 89%, not a small chunk, mm -hmm. is only through sexual, sexual intercourse partners. with a positive woman or a positive man. If really, if this is what uh, uh, the gentleman questioned me is right, the country with a lot of cultural values and it is, I do respect my country. I feel proud to be an Indian. At the same time, it should not be hypocrisy.
So what we see is in spite of having a very rich cultural yeah. heritage, yeah. there is a loss of values, there yes. is a big gap, there yeah. is a big lacuna yeah. and no matter how proud we are about our heritage, that heritage, that moral values have to come into action today. Yes. Mr. Srinivasan, here only I wanted to tell you, institutions like Brahma Kumaris should come little forward and revitalize the society with a readable vigor. Why I say that? India is the youngest country in the world. In India today, between 25 and 35 years age group, 70 percent. So unless we take care of this particular chunk and unless we inculcate in them the value-based education and also we have to inculcate in them the ethical values, the moral values, added to that, whatever we teach, whatever we read, whatever we hear, we have to practice. Without practice, nothing will happen. So we must influence the youth either by counseling or by case study or by psychotherapy or by biofeedback, whatever philosophy you use, unless we make use of all tools available to bring a change in the behavioral pattern of the youth of this country and what all we have been proud of being Indians. That cannot be replicated or that cannot be mirrorized in the world. So that way, I am really uh, being an individual and being an Indian, feeling sorry for that and uh, we should all join hands to see that, to make a proud India, let the youth of this country realize their duties, their responsibilities and their moral values. There are challenges, there are difficulties as a, as a country with which has the second largest number of population in yes, the world, yes. um, it's quite a difficult task to motivate all of these kinds of people, especially when uh, the times are changing. There is the internet revolution, there is the telecom revolution, uh, there is greenhouse effect, there are there's so many things. Culturally, we are changing very rapidly and uh, most of the times we do not have time to even think about what is changing around us. In the times when we are moving so fast, at this point of time, how relevant do you think spirituality is for our current generation, for our current times that we live in? Yes, spirituality is very relevant because we are in the crossroads now. One side, what all you said, the internet explosion, then social media and information which is being given right or wrong. And other side, there is not a real institutionalized and regulated preachings for young people. I always believe the mother should be the first one at the level of home to be a spiritual guru and to be a physician. From there, the school level, the teacher should be an example, an exemplary and he should be a spiritual guru. Why? Because even WHO has said health is not mere absence of disease. It is a physical, social, psychological and spiritual health he is the health. And health I mean health of society, a positive health for society and for a young person or to have a healthy society, healthy India, a India with higher values, the spirituality can only bring down and spirituality only can bring out, I mean to say, it can bring out whatever inherent energy and that is there in human beings. And spirituality can ignite what energy is there given by Almighty to everybody and what Brahmakumari says today, as long as you can able to connect your eye, the soul, with Paramatma and then the Paramatma will guide you what is good, what is not good and definitely in the days where we are facing lot of crisis in the world today, in the times where the humanity is facing wars on one side, everybody mix on another side and typhoons and everything at this particular stage, the only answer, the spirituality, the meditation, and with the powerful tool, the human beings, 
if they can able to connect the eye, the soul with the Almighty, the Paramatma, definitely that is going to bring a change in society, not only at individual level, but even at the society level and that would definitely will, I am sure, India will it have its glory and what past regained, whatever that is there in the moral values, ethical values, spiritual values and what not. So, that I am, my vision is also let we have that in the days to come. It is a wonderful vision actually and it is possible if yeah. we could bring about small yes. changes in yes. ourselves. Yes. On the last note, I would yeah. ask one yeah. small yeah. question. Yeah. You have come to the Brahma Kumari's headquarter, you have attended the conference, you have met people, yes. seen a lot of things here. How was your experience? What did you like about uh, being in the this The moment place? I landed in this holy land, let me use the word holy land, I received uh, an unusual experience. Some vibrations from all sides, east, west, south, north, from everywhere and also from here to Mount Abu. So, wherever I go, I received a positive energy. I received something new world. I always think if you can replicate this in the entire universe, the global peace is very simple. The world peace, it is only at a yardstick distance. Repeat what I am seeing in the Mount Ab. The other thing amazing to me, the sun in the east and the moon on the sky, they always follow a discipline. They always, nobody is there to tell them to sun or moon. By nature, they follow a cycle and they follow a rhythm. I see the similar thing here in Mount Abu. There is no one to say, you do this, you do that. A rhythm and a cycle and the events, the programs and everything they are going as though it is a prefixed and predetermined by Almighty or supernatural power. That is the reason why I compare the activities of Mount Abu with the activities of Lord Sun and Moon. Perhaps from centuries, from centuries, centuries, Sun and Moon, they are always on their particular discipline. And same discipline I have seen in Mount Abu. I do not think, uh, I, have, I have gone to lot of uh, places. I went to, uh, I have seen more than 80 to 90 countries in the world. Even I have, uh, uh, I have seen lot of uh, what we call uh, places uh, which teach about uh, particularly the God, the spirit, the religion. This uh, sort of uh, discipline I have never come across anywhere. And today I am totally a different personality in the sense the experience what I had, the blissfulness what I had and the feelings what I am really vibrating in my mind and the body. And if I can able to uh, utilize this for the welfare of humanity, I feel I have, there is a meaning for my life. Thank you very much, Dr. Rao. Um, the words that you have spoken, I think it has both inspired people to do good work and the time those who are doing good work, it has inspired them to con continue their good work. Thank you so much for coming on the show and we hope that this would not be the last one. You would keep coming here again. <laughs> Thank you, Srinidhi. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Surya Rao for you and uh, with his words, he has shared a lot more than what we can gather. He has inspired, he has given you a hope that even with small steps, even with a better understanding, we can bring about a change. And a better world is not very far away. Only with we changing inside, a lot more can happen. On that note, I end and I'll see you in the next episode. Till then, take care.